Howdy again everyone, and let's get straight into testing out the brightest aperture camera lens commercially available on the market right now, the Handavision, also known as Kipon, Ibelux 40mm f0.85 Mark II. It's designed for mirrorless cameras, and its image can cover an APS-C sized sensor, so it comes in Fuji X, Sony E, Canon EOS M, and Micro Four Thirds flavours. It won't fit onto any digital SLR camera at all, and if you were to fit it to one of Sony's full frame mirrorless cameras, then here's approximately the vignetting you would get if you weren't shooting in crop mode. So. This is an exciting lens, even on an APS-C camera, the artistic and low light potential of an f0.85 lens is pretty spectacular, your images will be the full frame equivalent of a 60mm lens with a depth of field of f1.2 or so, which is pretty spectacular. But of course, you should get the very fast shutter speeds of f0.85 for shooting in darker conditions, we'll test that in a minute and on Micro Four Thirds, it's the full frame equivalent of 80mm with a depth of field of f1.8 or so. So it's a great option for portrait pictures and subject photography, but still with a broad enough field of view for everyday photography, well, on APS-C particularly. And this is also really a pretty mysterious lens, it's hard to find official information about it online, and its price fluctuates wherever you can find it, but typically its cost brand new is around one and a half thousand US dollars. Yes, you heard me correctly, you really have to pay for this uniquely bright optic. I'm testing out the newer Mark II version of the lens, there are mixed reports and sparse information on the internet as to how the Mark II version is different from the original, but apparently the changes are minimal with slightly better build quality and maybe improved lens coatings for better contrast. Well, let's start by investigating that amazing maximum aperture a bit more closely. If ever you thought f2.8 was a bright maximum aperture to have on a camera lens, well, this particular lens is somewhere in a ballpark of 12 times brighter than that. f0.85 is approximately half as bright again as f1.0, f0.7 would be twice as bright, and if you want an f0.7 lens then you'll have to get in touch with the estate of Stanley Kubrick. Well, let's compare this lens to another 40mm option. To the right, I've attached a Sigma 40mm f1.4 art lens to my Fuji camera using a rudimentary adapter, and taken pictures against the Handavision lens on the left, whose maximum aperture should be about three times brighter or so. Well, what do you think? In terms of shutter speed, the Ibelux lens seems to be letting in about twice as much light as the Sigma, and that doesn't surprise me too much actually, because on extremely bright aperture lenses, the actual light transmission can be a little darker than you'd expect. In terms of depth of field, to my eyes, those backgrounds look a little over twice as out of focus. They're impressive, although the actual quality of the bokeh on the Sigma lens looks nicer to me. Here's another couple of example pictures which confirmed my findings, shutter speed twice as fast on a hand vision lens, and backgrounds over twice as out of focus. In case you are wondering, here's what the difference in sharpness looks like when you zoom in. Well, we'll look at image quality a bit further in a minute. Before that, let's look at the build quality of the lens. What hits you immediately is its crazy size. As you can see, for an APS-C lens, it's an absolute behemoth. I mean, for comparison, here's the Miticon 35mm f0.95. Remember, the Handavision lens's aperture is only slightly brighter, and it's hardly lightweight either, tipping the scales at 2.5 pounds or about 1.2 kilograms. That's heavy. The body of the lens, you won't be surprised to hear, is made of metal, and it feels very, very tough. There's no weather sealing around the rear lens mount. At the top of the lens, we encounter a pet hate of mine, a screw-in lens cap. Yeah, not exactly time-saving, and with that design there's an increased risk that it could slip when you finally get it off and, and scratch the front glass element. 
Then there's a built-in lens hood, normally a cool feature, but unfortunately this one barely moves forward at all and slips up and down easily, so pretty useless. Next, the focus ring, which turns very smoothly and very precisely, thank goodness, otherwise focusing at f0.85 would get a bit tricky. Now the aperture ring. It barely moves at all between f0.85 and f1. My guess is that the markings aren't particularly accurate, although I did measure a small change in my image quality tests. I do appreciate the aperture ring having gentle clicks to it each f-stop though, and those f-stops are spaced out evenly, so it will function nicely for stills photographers. Overall, apart from its behemoth size and weight, the lens controls perfectly well in use, but boy do I despise that screw in lens cap design. I'd recommend buying your own 67mm lens cap to replace it. Well, let's look at image quality now on a 24 megapixel Fuji X-T20. A Kippon representative mentioned to Kai Wong that the Fuji version of this lens performs better than the Sony version does, apparently, goodness knows why, but because of that, I thought I'd source out a Fuji version of this lens for testing. Absolutely key for any potential buyer is how it performs at f0.85, that's what people are spending their one and a half thousand dollars on after all. So let's take a look. In the middle, with the aperture wide open, we see an impressive sweet spot of sharpness in the middle of the image, but on contrasting edges we see loads of ghosting and very strong purple fringing, and a low contrast throughout the whole image. As you begin to look away from the middle of the image, picture quality becomes very soft very quickly. F1.0 is about the same in the corners, but back in the middle there's a touch more contrast and a touch less purple fringing. At F1.4, the purple fringing isn't gone, but it's greatly reduced, and the contrast is much better there. The corners still look pretty terrible. At f2, there's a clearer picture there, though, and the middle looks very impressive now, with no more colour fringing. f2.8 is perfect in the middle, and not bad in the corners. f4 is very sharp in the corners, but we see some colour fringing in the very edges. It's about the same at f5.6 and down to f11. f16 is softer due to diffraction, but not too bad. So overall, well, it's complicated. From f4 you get great image quality from corner to corner, at very wide apertures though, there are a large number of problems you'll want to work around, and you'll definitely find yourself habitually adding more contrast into your images. Let's look a little deeper for a moment though, as this is such a unique lens I want to show you a little more about its behaviour in low light conditions to help interpret those test chart results. Here's an image taken in a dark at f0.85, and you can see that there's a lot of sharpness and detail in the middle of the image, but when contrasting edges come in, or bright points of light, we see giant balls of purple. There's a small improvement at f1.0, a big improvement at f1.4, and good quality in the middle from f2. So it really has very complicated optical characteristics for general shooting. But for portrait pictures without strong contrasts, as you can see here, that sweet spot of sharpness at f0.85 will just about shine through. Ok, let's move on and look at distortion and vignetting. We see moderate barrel distortion here, and at f0.85 there's very strong vignetting which strengthens suddenly towards the very edges of the image, it's really noticeable in virtually all your pictures. F1.0 is the same really, at f1.4 there's an improvement, but only at f2 do the corners brighten up quite a lot. Next, this lens can focus as closely as 75cm from your subject, not very close at all really. At f0.85 there's still some good resolution to be found close up, but that's countered by tons of ghosting and very low contrast. You'll need to stop down to f1.4 to see a decent improvement, and finally at f2 it looks pretty sharp. Next, work against bright lights. Wow, this lens is a trip. 
Bright light of almost any intensity will throw up huge reflections off this lens's internal elements, creating complex, hypnotizing patterns which will really disrupt your images. It's a shame that that built-in lens hood doesn't extend outwards a lot more to help out. And now, bokeh. This lens can give you really deeply out of focus backgrounds with ease, but what's the quality of the bokeh like? Those backgrounds look a bit smudgy in places, but actually, they're generally smooth enough, particularly when they're deeply out of focus. I never took a sample picture where I thought the bokeh looked really ugly. They do have a distinct look to them. Something further to note is a rather extreme level of longitudinal chromatic aberration at f0.85. As you can see in the open sign here, some very strong purple fringing before the plane of focus and yellow beyond. You'll have to stop down to at least f1.4 to see it reduced. Right then, overall, what an interesting lens. Honestly, from a size, weight and price perspective, it's a disaster. From an image quality perspective, it can get some quite astonishing images for you, but you'd have to be someone who cares very little about picture quality to be satisfied with its performance at bright apertures, especially f0.85. Anyone who's really into their artistic photography will find it really enjoyable, but look for a moment at the competition. If this really is the kind of lens you're looking for, then honestly, just get the far smaller, far less expensive Miticon 35mm f0.95. That lens's image quality is better too. Bearing in mind the existence of that Miticon lens, there's simply no way I can recommend the Handrevision Ibelux 40mm f0.85. Unfortunately, no matter what idiosyncratic splendor it bathes in.